Welcome again to the fourth Sunday of Advent. I hope that you've taken time during the first three weeks of Advent to really do what we've tried to encourage you to do, to take a week to just prepare your heart and how you would need to encounter God this week, that you take a week to just think about the hope that is yours in Christ Jesus, that you take a week to consider the joy that's yours in following Jesus. And maybe you've been able to do that and you just can't wait uh, for Christmas, but evidently by your response that that Sandra called out as sad, I believe was the word that she used earlier this morning. Maybe you're just not ready for Christmas, and so we want to make sure that this next week is a chance for you to really be prepared. And by the way, I hope that you're making plans to come next Sunday at 10 o'clock as we uh, greet one another on Christmas morning. We won't keep you more than an hour, but we're just going to, both of our parishes come together to worship and celebrate Christmas Day together next Sunday. And so I hope you're making plans. But, but if you're not quite ready for Christmas, I want to talk to you today about loving But in order to talk about loving, I need to ask you this question. Uh, What are you expecting to find under the Christmas tree this Christmas? What are you expecting to find under the Christmas tree this Christmas? Anybody in the room want to tell me what you're expecting to find under the Christmas tree? Anybody? Love, joy. Anybody else? What are you expecting? What are your children expecting to find under the Christmas tree? This, this room was filled with uh, uh, middle school and high schoolers this morning, and I got uh, the first thing out of somebody's mouth was a trip to the Bahamas, and so I'm like, I want to be part of your family. And then uh, somebody said phones. They were expecting phones. Somebody said a 3D DS. Uh, anybody else? What are you expecting Christmas? Adults, not just for the children. Nobody? You're easy. There's just going to be... Clothes, yeah, somebody, one of the teenagers said clothes, but didn't say it with excitement in his heart when he, when he mentioned clothes. When, when it comes to expecting, there's things that you expect and you kind of hope for, but then there are just certain things that you expect knowing that they're going to be there. I, I didn't think about this until uh, about two months ago as so I was really zeroing in on the teaching series. And, and for the last 27, 28 years, I have come to expect something underneath my Christmas tree, and every year I knew it was going to be there. And it started happening when I started hanging out with Autumn's family. When we were dating, and uh, Autumn, for those of you that don't know, is my wife, and and when we started dating, uh, the first year that I went with her to her grandmother's house for Christmas celebration, she was giving me the quiz, and her her mom has... uh, four sisters and a brother, and they're each married, so there's ten. And I come from a family where it's just me and my brother, and my, my dad's brother was in the army, and so he lived away, so we never had my dad's brother. My mom's brother lived far away, and so we never had extended family Christmases, so this was a brand new experience to me. And so I'm getting quizzed all the way down, you know, this 30-mile drive we're taking to her grandma's house. Okay, Vera's married to who? Uh, Sue's married to which one? And, and so Sammy's married to, and so, and then to throw that on, she's got like 17 cousins. And so this room is just packed with people. And I'm sitting there, and, and, and so presents start to get passed out, and there's a present in front of me that has my name on it, and everybody starts to chuckle. And it's like, okay, Tim, you go first. And I look around, and all the cousins have a similar package, and like, you go first. I'm like, well, why do I have to go first? Well, we know what it already is. We already know what it is. Because every year, Autumn's mom, or they call Aunt Nita, Aunt Nita gives everybody, all of the cousins, the same gift. And about 27, 28 years ago, she started giving me the same gift every Christmas, underwear. And so here, I'm the rookie here in the family, and so I get to open the underwear first. I don't know that it's a family tradition. I have no idea. But every year, for the last 27, 28 years, I've got underwear from Autumn's mom for Christmas. Except last year. There's no underwear from Autumn's mom underneath my Christmas tree. Those of you may remember that Last Christmas season, on December the 8th, we got word that Autumn's mom had been diagnosed with stage 4 ovarian cancer. And throughout Christmas, we spent with her mom, Autumn spent with her mom, and we went back, and as her mom was literally fighting for her life. And just this weekend, we got uh, the Christmas letter that her mom sent out, and her mom never sends out Christmas letters, but she sent out a Christmas letter just proclaiming God's goodness, that now she's 100% cancer-free. And so it's a different Christmas. And so, you know, I couldn't really complain last year that I didn't have underwear under my tree, but now that it's a year later, I'm hoping, I'm expecting there to be more underwear underneath my Christmas tree this year. There's just some things you come to expect and rely on. This Christmas season, what are you expecting and relying on from God? What are you truly expecting this Christmas season and every day of your life for God to provide you? Because you see, this Christmas season and every Christmas season, Jesus didn't come to fight for his life. He came to fight for your life. And he offers some amazing gifts. If you have a Bible, turn with me, if you would, to Matthew chapter 2. 
Matthew chapter 2, it's part of the Christmas story, and it's part of the Christmas story that we mess up because we Americans have a tendency to do that. It's the Christmas story of the wise men, Matthew chapter 2, and we have a tendency to put the wise men at the manger scene, and we'll find as we read through this, the wise men don't show up at the manger. They show up a couple of years later at a house, and so it's just this interesting thing. So Matthew chapter 2, I want to read for you verses 1 through 12. If you have a Bible, follow along. If you want to use one of the Bibles that's provided there for you, about the middle of your Bible, Matthew's the first book of the New Testament. There's a table of contents. By the way, if you don't have a Bible, stop by the Connect Desk. We'd love to give you one today. All right? So let me read Matthew chapter 2, starting in verse 1. After Jesus was born in Bethlehem in Judea, during the time of King Herod, Magi from the east came to Jerusalem and asked, Where's the one who's been born, king of the Jews? We saw a star when it rose, and we've come to worship him. When King Herod heard this, he was disturbed, and all Jerusalem with him. And when he called together all the people's chief priests and teachers of the law, he asked them where the Messiah was to be born. In Bethlehem in Judea, they replied, for this is what the prophet has written. But you, Bethlehem, in the land of Judah, by are no means the least among the rulers of Judah. For out of you will come a ruler who will be a shepherd to my people Israel. So Herod then called the Magi secretly and found out from them the exact time the star had appeared. And he sent them to Bethlehem and said, Go, make careful search for the child. As soon as you find him, report back to me so that I too may go and worship him. And after they had heard the king, they went on their way. And the star they had seen when it rose went ahead of them until it stopped over the place where the child was. When they saw the star, they were overjoyed. On coming to the house, they saw the child with his mother Mary, and they bowed down and worshipped him. Then they opened their treasures and presented him with gifts of gold, frankincense, and myrrh. And having been warned in a dream not to go back to Herod, they returned to their country by another route. This is the word of God for the people of God. And so we come to understand from this story that there are certain things we can expect. Now before we talk about the wise men, which is really going to kind of be the focus and their journey that that year to to worship at Jesus' feet, before we do that, we have to remember that this story is really a story about Jesus. It says after, chapter 2, verse 1, after Jesus was born. After Jesus was born, I need you to understand, if you're going to come to expect to find anything this Christmas season, you need to come to expect to find Jesus. If you're going to expect to find anything this Christmas season, you need to come to expect it only through Jesus. Now this is a story that is being told to us, and it is a story of revelation. That God has chosen to reveal himself to us in a brand new way. Unlike he had ever done it before, through the prophets, through the Old Testament, chosen to reveal himself to us through his living son. It's a story of revelation. It is the story of the incarnation of God. Coming in the flesh, Eugene Peterson in the message paraphrase says that God became flesh and blood and moved into the neighborhood. It's the story of the incarnation, God taking on human form. And it is the story of salvation. This is the story that we're talking about. And anything you want to come and find through Christmas, these things that are going to last are going to come through the story of Jesus Christ. Revelation, incarnation, salvation. Think about it just for a minute with me. We've looked at this passage of Scripture, Philippians 2. Who Jesus, being very nature with God, did not consider equality with God something to be grasped, but he emptied himself. Taking on the form of a servant and being found in human appearance, he humbled himself, became obedient unto death, even death on a cross. The incarnation. How many of you have ever moved before? Anybody in the room have the uh, hatred for moving that I have, whether it's across town or across country? Anybody? Yes, thank you very much. I don't like packing up the boxes because when you move, you pack up the stuff and you pack up even the stuff that you haven't used for a while because it's still your stuff and you've got to take it with you, right? And even if you hire people to help you move, you just got to pack the stuff. And I don't like moving because you've got to take all the stuff with you. When God the Father called God the Son to his side in heaven and he said, I know that you were present with me at creation. I know you spoke things into existence. I know that everything you spoke into existence was created by you and for you and through you. He says, I understand that, but now it's time. I want you to know you're my beloved Son in whom I'm well pleased, but now I'm sending you to planet Earth. It's time to go. And you're going to go in the form of a little baby. And you're going to be born of a virgin. And you're going to come through the birth canal. And you're going to look like a member of the traitor race. You're going to be in flesh, and and it's going to be different. I love you, but bye-bye, it's time to go. And guess what? Jesus didn't get to pack his bags. Jesus didn't bring anything with him. That's what it means he emptied himself. Everything in heaven was rightfully his, and he left it behind to come to earth as a baby in the flesh, incarnate, to reveal to you and to me God himself and to offer us salvation. This is a story of revelation, incarnation, and salvation. And Jesus willingly came. So if you're looking for other things, I would just encourage you to go back to Jesus today. But then it says, 
that after Jesus was born in Bethlehem, the time of King Herod, Magi from the east traveled. Now you've heard stories about the Magi, and you, we, we don't know the great number of them. We believe there was a caravan of them. We kind of attribute that there were three of them based on the fact that there were three gifts that were given, but nowhere in the scriptures does it say there were only three. But these wise men, this group of wise men came. The, the Greek word Magi is the plural of the word magos. It, it, it means magician. It means sorcerer. Uh, they came to understand that these, these men were, were astronomers and they were, were, were able to, to see spiritual things. They were considered spiritual advisors. The, the Hebrew word, and we need to see this, is hakamim, and it's in the plural, hakim, is, is magician, it's sorcerer, it's one who's able to, to do divination and, and able to see into the future. But they're, again, spiritual advisors. But they're also, in addition to being spiritual advisors, they're ambassadors. They're representatives of their country to go on behalf of their government to another land, to another nation, to, to be dignitaries at, at big events. You've seen the times when you know, the president will send the vice president to be a dignitary. These are ambassadors on behalf of a, another government. They come to, to worship. And it's important that we understand this. But what I want you to see at this point is these people traveled a great distance at great risk to bring great presence. They, they traveled a great distance we believe that they came from the east. We believe that they came from the southern tip of the Arabian Peninsula, modern day what we'd call Yemen, and they would travel about 1,800 miles across the desert. And it was not an easy journey. It was a great distance at great risk. They were under great risk just because the travel was hard. Many people would die, die as they went across these trade routes. They were at great risk because they were traveling in a caravan with great wealth. And part of this trade route, well, they don't have, you know, interstate highways like we have interstate highways. And the routes get small and there are twists and turns where, where thugs and thieves would stand ready to, to raid these caravans trying to take this great wealth. And so they risk a great distance at great risk to their own personal life. We'll also see that they took a great risk by not being honest with King Herod. King Herod had found out he probably would have killed them. Great, great distance, great risk to bring great presence, to bring great gifts. Why? Here's the sermon in a sentence. If you're following along on a teaching outline, the next blank, this is the sermon in a sentence. And the sermon in a sentence very simply is this. My conduct is controlled by my expectations. My conduct is controlled by my expectations. These people, these ambassadors had some kind of expectations. Did they want to maintain a good working relationship with the new king? That they want to ensure that these trade routes stayed open so that their, their gold, their frankincense, their myrrh, all of their spices could be sold. See, King Herod got wealthy based on these trade routes. King Herod got wealthy by making sure there was a good agreement between all of these people who would bring their spices, their gold, their wealth to his country where north, south, east, and west intersected. And he got part of the profits. It's how he got so rich. Rich enough at one point to pay for the entire Olympic Games out of his own pocket. That's how King Herod got wealthy. Did they want to maintain this kind of working relationship with the new king? I don't know, but they had some kind of expectations that controlled their conduct to travel a great distance at great risk. If you're not sure that you buy into the fact that your conduct controls your expectations, let me just ask any of you who have ever had the joy of having a young child in your house on Christmas morning to think with me for a minute. Did you have to work at waking them up on Christmas morning? They're up at an unruly hour, ready to go, because there are expectations of what awaits them wherever the Christmas tree might be, right? Their conduct uh, is controlled by their expectations. Compare that, if you would, please, to any given Wednesday morning during the school year. <laughs> exactly. Their conduct is controlled by their expectations. There's no motivation to get out on Wednesday. Can I not just roll over and go back to sleep? Our conduct is controlled by our expectations. And some of you need to understand that you haven't yet received from Christ what you are longing to receive this Christmas season. I just want to ask you, is it because of your expectations? And so the question of the morning very simply is this. What do you expect to find from God this Christmas season? Your conduct will be controlled by your expectations. Now before we answer that question, what you can expect to find, I need to say something to you for just a minute about Herod. The scripture says that we read out of Matthew chapter 2, when Herod uh, heard this, where's the one who's been born king of the Jews? When Herod heard this, he was disturbed. Why, why was he disturbed? 
Herod was a bit paranoid to start with. We've looked at his life before and we've seen that he was king and he thought a couple of his sons were trying to, to, to take over his throne and he killed his own sons. And not just kind of killed, he killed them brutally. And it's not a surprise to us that he would kill all the babies two years and old and under just to make sure that this king of the Jews wouldn't be alive. Nobody to take his throne. He was, he was disturbed. But the reason I think he's disturbed is because Herod has an understanding of Hebrew prophecy. Herod has an understanding, at least a little bit of understanding, of the Hebrew prophecies as they relate to him. Now, he doesn't understand the prophecies about where Messiah is supposed to be born because he could really care less. But all the prophecies that concern him, I think he has some insight into. And one of the prophecies that's given in the book of Numbers, if you're following along, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, the fourth book in your Bible, is given by an international wise man, an international magician, someone who has a claim. His name was Balaam. And Balaam was hired by a king called Balak to come to the land in order to put a curse on the children of Israel. And so Balaam comes because he's a magician, he's a, he's a spiritual person, he's a, he's a hakim, he's a wise man, and he comes with a soul and prayer. He's getting paid to put a curse, a spiritual curse, on the land of Israel. Now some of you will remember Balaam because he had a talky, talking donkey. You remember the story of Balaam and his talking donkey? It's found in the book of Numbers, the 23rd chapter. And so Balaam comes, being hired by the king to put a curse on the children of Israel. And he's getting on his donkey one day to go out and do this. And he's going down the road, and all of a sudden his donkey sees an angel of the Lord in the middle of the road, and Balaam doesn't see it. And the donkey just stops. And Balaam beats the donkey silly, and the donkey won't move. And finally the donkey begins to move and he, he still sees the angel of the Lord in the middle of the road. So the donkey goes to one side of the road and he pushes up. Now their roads aren't like our roads. Their roads run right along houses and right along walls. And it says that he gets so close to the, to the wall of the house that it crushes Balaam's foot. And Balaam just starts to beat the donkey again. And the donkey still sees the angel of the Lord in the middle of the road. And for a third time, Balaam beats the donkey and the donkey just falls down. And Balaam starts, to talk, uh, Balaam starts to talk to the donkey, and the donkey talks back. Now, how would you like to be in that situation, right? And the donkey talks back and says, what are you doing? Why are you beating me? How long have I been your donkey? Have, I ever act, have you ever known me to act like this? And Balaam's like, no. What's going on? And Balaam looks up, and there he sees the angel of the Lord. The angel of the Lord says something fascinating to Balaam at that point. He says this, the path that you are on before me is reckless path that you are on before me is reckless. The path that Herod was on was reckless. The path that Balaam was on to pronounce a curse on the children of Israel was reckless. And this Christmas season, I just want to ask you, is the path that you're on this morning a reckless one? Are you ignoring the way of God? Are you just living life your own way? You would say, I would never come to bring a curse on anybody, but, but I'm living my life as if it's cursed. I'm living my life without recognition really of God. Oh, he gets some attention from me, from me on, on Sundays for just a little while, but the path that I'm really on is reckless. If you're here today, I need you to understand that the reckless path is the path of sin. And from Herod, we understand that sin, every sin is an act of grasping, grasping, trying to be God trying to grab a hold of what it means to be God. Herod wanted to hold on to his throne, which, by the way, he purchased. He bought it. He was the highest bidder. He, he, he purchased it, and every sin is an attempt to grab a hold of the things that are God's, which is so unlike God, right? Jesus, who being very nature with God, did not consider equality with God something to be grasped. But he emptied himself. Is your path today reckless? Well, Balaam does this, and he doesn't pronounce a curse now. He begins to pronounce... Uh, prophecies over the children of Israel. In Numbers chapter 24, look at the prophecy that he pronounces over the children of Israel. Numbers, the 24th chapter, starting in the 17th verse, says this. I see him, but not now. I behold him, but not near. A star. <laughs> A star will come out of Jacob. A scepter will rise out of Israel. Edom will be conquered. Seer, his enemy, will be conquered, but Israel will grow strong. I believe Herod knew this prophecy. And the reason I believe Herod knew this prophecy is because it was a prophecy about him. See, Herod was an Edomite. And that prophecy says when the star arises and the one comes with a scepter in his hand, all of Edom will be destroyed. And so Herod, here's these wise men come to town and say, hey, where's the one who's been born king of the Jews? We saw his star when it rose. 
And we've come to worship, and, and Herod knows this means my death. This means, means my gig's up. And I'm going to do everything I can to hold on to being God of this world. And so Herod, his path was reckless. Balaam's path was reckless. Is your path today reckless before God? So, understanding that background, let me ask you again one more time. What can you expect to find this Christmas season? I, I want to share with you four things that you can expect to find this Christmas season based out of Matthew chapter 2. And the first thing you can expect to find this Christmas season, you may want to write it down a bunch of different ways, is salvation. You might want to say victory. You might want to say uh, deliverance. You might want to say freedom. And it comes from the names of Jesus used in Matthew chapter 2. You see that it starts out, now after the birth of Jesus, after the birth of Jesus, it calls him Jesus. Did you hear the Advent reading this morning? You'll name him Jesus because he will save his people from their sin. His name is Jesus, Yahshua, Yahweh, God saves. It is a promise of salvation in this Christmas season. If you are bound by sin, this Christmas season, if the path you are on is a reckless one, the promise for you is salvation and deliverance from your sin. The scripture says the wages of sin is death. But the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. God today offers you salvation and rescue and deliverance from your sin. Are you here today in need of salvation? But notice it's not just the name Jesus that's used in this passage. Isn't it interesting that when Herod goes to the teachers of the law, what does he ask? He doesn't say, where is Jesus supposed to be born? He says, where is the Messiah or the Christ going to be born? We're going to talk about the name Messiah next week. We'll talk a little bit about it this week. But Messiah is really the king. The ruler, the one in charge, the one who rescues, the one who delivers. And I don't know where you're at today on a spiritual journey, but you may need rescue from some addiction. You may need deliverance from some sin. You may need freedom and victory. And I just want to tell you today, you can expect that it is there. Not an expectation, well, that it might be there and I might get it or I might not. It is an expectation. It will be there every single day of your life. God offers you this salvation and this victory and this freedom and this deliverance. And the choice is yours whether or not you will accept it and Unwrap that gift of salvation. The second gift you can expect to find this Christmas season is direction. Direction. The wise men come to Jerusalem and they say, where's the one who's been born king of the Jews? We saw his star as it rose and we've come to worship him. Do you notice that the star only got them close? The star only got them close. The star got them to Jerusalem. And it was logical since, hey, it seems to be settling right over there. And where's the capital city? Oh, that's Jerusalem. People in Jerusalem ought to know the star got them close. The star originally did not get them to the child. What got them to the child? The written word of God got them to the child. Herod goes to the teacher of the law. Where is the one who has been born Messiah? Or where is the Messiah to be born? This is what the prophet has written in Bethlehem of Judea. It was the word of God that got them where Jesus was. My friends, there are a lot of things that can get you close to God. There are a lot of things that can put you in his general vicinity. But the wise men were six miles off. And they weren't in front of God yet. They started to ask people, hey, what can you tell me about the Messiah? Aren't you glad they found some people who knew? What if somebody were to ask you, hey, can you tell me how to find the Messiah? Could you tell them? But here's what I want you to know. There are a lot of things that will get you close to the Messiah, but there is only one thing that will get you in front of God, and that is the Word of God Himself, Jesus Christ. Only Jesus has access for you to the Father. Only Jesus has access to you for salvation and deliverance and freedom. Only Jesus. This is a story we start, started talking about. This is a story about Jesus. His revelation, His incarnation, and His salvation. What are you relying on to get you right with the Father. See, the star got them close. But God's Word delivered them. I don't know where you need direction in your life today. Relationally, financially, vocationally, spiritually, I don't know. But I want you to know that Jesus Christ said, I am the way the truth and the life, I'll get you where you need to go. And his promise to us after he left the planet was his spirit who was just like him, who will guide us into all truth. His spirit guides us. Lots of things can get you close. But only Jesus gets you there. You can find direction. The third thing that you can find this Christmas season, very simply, is joy. You can find joy. We talked about joy last week, and so you can log on to miamivalley.org 
go to our archived uh, media site and you can pull down last week's teaching, the video, and you can pull down the notes. And so you can get that. I don't want to talk to you uh, about joy in great detail. We talked about that last week. I want to talk to you about joy in this sense. Look with me, if you would, on your teaching outline. If you didn't have a teaching outline, it's Psalm 31, 7. Psalm 31, 7 says this. The ancient songwriter says, I am radiant with joy because of your mercy. For you have listened to my troubles and have seen the crisis in my soul. God, I'm radiant with joy. One, because you listened to my troubles. Because you've had mercy on me. You've seen the crisis in my soul. What's the crisis in your soul today? What's the crisis in your soul today that you don't think God's concerned about? If you will, this Christmas season, accept his gift of joy. You can be radiant with joy. Why? Because two things. He's acted in mercy towards you. He's listened to your troubles. He's concerned. We look at this passage of scripture all the time out of Exodus chapter 3 when God speaks to Moses, go set my people free. He says, I've heard the cry of my people. I've seen their misery and I am concerned. My friend, what's the crisis of your soul today? Don't go through this Christmas season allowing it to stay a crisis. God does not intend for it to be a crisis. God intends to take it and show you mercy and grace through it. He says, I am radiant with joy because of your mercy. Grace is receiving things that we don't deserve. Mercy is not getting what we do deserve. God's loving kindness. He doesn't want you to get what you do deserve. And Maybe you feel like you're there and in the crisis of your soul you've brought it all on yourself. God says, don't live with that. Cry out to me. And watch me act on your behalf. You can expect God to deliver you from the crisis in your soul today. But it starts with you crying out. Salvation, victory, freedom, deliverance. Um, you, you can expect to find direction. You can expect to find joy. And the fourth thing I've included for you on your teaching outline this morning that you can expect to find is opportunity. This Christmas season, in the next seven days, as you're moving towards Christmas, you can expect to find great opportunities. And underneath opportunity, I've listed four or five things for you. And the first opportunity that you can expect to find this Christmas season is the opportunity to see and to seek Jesus. To see and to seek Jesus. It says, when, the star, when they were told to go to Bethlehem, so the star rose and came to the place where he was. When they got there, they saw the child. My friend, you can expect to see God. Not in the flesh, but you can see him. You can see him. Everywhere you look, we talk about it this way around here, seeing the divine in the daily. Look at the person next to you there, inside of them, in the image of God, God's there. And the opportunities that are around you, see God in his hand and his, his opportunity for you to experience him and his salvation and his deliverance. Look everywhere around you and see God. But the scriptures say you'll only see him and find him when you seek him with your whole heart. These People, these wise men, traveled a great distance at great risk to see the Savior. How far are you willing to travel to find him? How, how much are you really willing to seek him? Most of us won't go a great distance. Most of us won't even go the distance from here to here. To our knees, to seek him with all of our heart. Say, God, I've got crisis in my soul, and I need to see you deliver me in the midst of this. Most of us won't even do that. What distance are you willing to travel to seek Jesus? Remember the story of Moses, God's rescuer of the children of Israel. God said to him, I've chosen you. Remember where God spoke to him the first time out of a burning bush? Moses was on the backside of the desert. And he came to this burning bush, and God spoke to him out of the burning bush, said, take your sandals off, this place is holy. I choose you, go to Pharaoh and tell him to let my people go. Elizabeth Barrett Browning says, the whole earth is ablaze with the glory of God. Only those who stop notice. The rest sit idly by and pick blackberries. I love that quote. Only those who stop notice. Part of seeking God this Christmas season is stopping. And if you expect that stopping will produce benefits for you, it will change your conduct because your conduct is controlled by your expectations. And some of you are rushing through this Christmas season refusing to stop and refusing to bring God into it because the reality of it is you don't expect anything from him. If you'll stop, you can expect this Christmas season the opportunity to see and seek Jesus. You can expect the opportunity to worship to worship. We're going to have opportunity to worship next Christmas, uh, Christmas morning at 10 o'clock. We're going to worship together at uh, 
4 p.m. and 10 p.m. on Christmas Eve. Those are opportunities. But you can expect opportunities to worship in your own home. You can expect opportunities this week to worship at your workplace. And the first step to worship, the first act of worship, my friends, is always humility. Humility is always the first act of worship. It says when they got there and they saw the child and his mother, they bowed down. They got on their knees because they recognized who he is. That passage I've been quoting from Philippians chapter 2 has an ending that we haven't been talking about. And the ending says, Therefore God has highly exalted him and given him the name that is above every other name, that at the name of Jesus every knee will bow and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. There will come a point in time when your knee will bow and confess Jesus is Lord. That's what the scripture says. I just don't want it to be too late for you. Scripture says that you need to make that confession now. Today is the day of salvation, not to wait. There will come a time when you will bow down and confess Jesus as Lord. Why won't you do it now? The first act of worship is humility. One of the things we're going to look at next year as we've outlined the teaching series come summer, we're going to do a very specific four or five week series on prayer. Have you ever been praying and you started to pray, and you started to spend time in front of God, and the next thing you know, you're thinking about your grocery list. Or the next thing you know, you're thinking about the 15 different places the kids need to be. And like, I thought I was praying, and now all of a sudden I'm thinking about something else. It's just a common human tendency, and our, our Jewish friends address that, and they say what needs to happen is, is this, this concept called kavanah. It, it, it talks about intention or devotion, but it's also a mindset. It's a mindset that I need to be intentional. I need to, de- need to be zeroed in. Maybe I can explain it best this way. I don't know if you've ever had the privilege or the opportunity to worship in a Jewish synagogue. But if you worship in a Jewish synagogue, most Jewish synagogues have a special place where they keep the scroll, where they keep the Torah. And, and it's up there, and it's in a special and a, and, and a wonderful place. And most of those places have a, have a plaque or an inscription next to the scroll. And it simply reads this, Know before whom you stand. When you come to the Word of God, know before whom you stand. When you come to the living Word of God, know before whom you stand. And the wise men knew before whom they stood, and they bowed their knee in humility. Maybe this Christmas season you're not having the opportunity to worship God because you're just so arrogant and proud. that You're not willing to do what he said. The first act of worship is always humility. I'll find the opportunity to see and seek God. I'll find the opportunity to worship. The third thing you'll have the opportunity to do is to offer God your very best. I will have the opportunity this Christmas season to offer God my very best. One of the scriptures says that they came in front of the Jesus, they bowed down and worshiped him, and they opened their treasure chests. I think that's the accurate picture. They opened their treasure chest. They traveled in this caravan with, with gold, frankincense, and myrrh, the very best that they had to offer. And you and I, because of uh, its price per ounce right now, well, I did close at almost $1,600 an ounce this, this last weekend, gold, most, most of us, that's, that, that's got to be the most valuable thing, right? Of the three gifts, gold, frankincense, and myrrh, it was the least valuable. It was the least valuable. Herod got rich controlling these trade routes, and he wanted these trade routes not for the gold. He wanted these trade routes for the spices. These spices which come from the, from the sap or the root of trees were the most valuable spices in the world. And he got wealthy on these spices. So they bring gold, but they bring frankincense and myrrh. Why would they bring that? Because they understood that this baby was a king. In Jesus' day and before Jesus would show up on the scene, if you wanted to crown a king or, or, or at the coronation of a king, you didn't put a crown on his head. You put oil on his head. And the king would carry this, this special scent with him all of his life. In Psalm 45, the seventh stanza, it says this, Your love, You love righteousness and hate wickedness. Therefore, God, your God, has set you above your companions by anointing you with the oil of joy. All your robes are fragrant with myrrh. All your robes. It's this picture of, of a king, and he's, he, he's coming forward, and you, he's got this special scent because he's got this special, we might call it perfume. It's a, a unique scent only to him. You turn over a couple of books uh, to the Song of Songs, the third chapter. The Song of Songs, the third chapter, says this in the seventh verse, uh, sixth verse. Who's coming up from the wilderness like a column of smoke, perfumed with myrrh, made from all the spices of the merchant? Look, it's Solomon's carriage. King Solomon came, and his scent traveled before him. Oh, that smell, that's Solomon. And 
Jesus would have this, this unique scent made up of frankincense and myrrh and spices that were used to anoint him that day as king. Now some are also going to say that myrrh would also be the spice used when you wrap somebody in death clothes. That strips of, those strips of linen would be, would be fragrant with myrrh. Again, as a sign, as an understanding that this king was born to die so that you could live. He didn't come to fight for his life. He came to fight for your life. And so you have the opportunity. They offered him his very best. They traveled great distance at great risk to give him their very best gift. That's why in a few moments we're going to ask you to come forward and, and give the gift this Christmas season. We've asked you for the last month to prayerfully consider making the largest Christmas gift you give, a gift to Miami Valley Community Church. A gift that we promise you 100 pennies of every dollar would be used to clothe cold children, to feed hungry children, to take care of the needs of the children in the Miamisburg community. It's a time to offer God your very best, to make a sacrifice. We've also asked you that as the year 2012 rolls around, that all of you would consider a one way to offer God your very best to make a sacrificial gift is to take the 1% challenge. And the 1% challenge says, I will give 1% more of my income this year than I gave in 2011. We've asked you to consider that as one way, again, to sacrifice and give God your very best. We've also asked you not just to give God the best of your money, but to give God the best of your time, that each and every one of you would figure out a way to find one ministry area where you could faithfully serve for one year. Talk to your parish shepherd, talk to the pastoral staff about what it would take commitment-wise, time-wise, to offer God your very best. Most of the time, he doesn't get our very best. We're not willing to travel great distance, and we're not going to take a great risk. Why in the world would you waste gold and precious spices on a baby? Why would you do that? You'll have the opportunity to offer God your very best. And finally... You'll simply have the opportunity this Christmas season to get in the way of Jesus. Remember it says that after they had worshipped Jesus, after they'd opened their treasure chest and given him gifts, they were warned in a dream by the angel not to go back to Herod, so they returned to their country by another route. Jesus doesn't want to make his way obscure. He wants to make it clear. And for some of you, Part of walking in the way of Jesus is he's going to tell you, stop going down that path. The path you're on right now before me is reckless. Go a different way. Go a way that honors me. Go a way that pleases me. Go a way that I want you. Go the way that I want you to go. There's an opportunity to walk in the way of Jesus. And it comes back to the path that you choose. Why do we get so excited about the Christmas season? Why do we get so excited about what it means to come and celebrate the birth of Jesus? Here's one of the reasons I think. I think it's because we'd like to keep him a baby. How many of you, when you have a chance, about to pick on uh, Emily Morton here, because I, I see that she, she did this, she turned around and grabbed the baby from the baby's mom this morning. Nimity's holding the baby. How many of you, when you see a brand new baby, just want to hold it, pick it up, and squeeze it? It's one of the perks of my job that I get to go to the hospital after, after birth and get to hold infant babies early on. It's so fun, and it drives my girls crazy every time I tell them I get to go to the hospital and hold the, the baby. You see, most of us would like to keep Jesus that way where we can pick him up and control him, and, and he's dependent on us. We don't like him all grown up. We don't like him in control of us. We want to be in control of him. And this Christmas season, if you will surrender to the salvation, rescue, deliverance, and freedom, and victory that God offers, his control of you is control of grace and mercy and love. Will you surrender to that today? You see, if you want to do this, if you want to find what you're expecting to find this Christmas season, if your conduct is controlled by your expectation, your conduct has to include sincere investigation, sacrificial adoration, and personal transformation. How does God want to change you today? Almighty God, we come in front of you this very day, thankful for Jesus. Thankful for the example of however many men it was that traveled a great distance at great risk to, to offer great gifts. Thankful for their example of what it means to bow down and humble themselves in front of you. 
God, I pray for the one this Christmas season that desperately needs to experience and find your salvation. May they just say yes to Jesus. God, for the one who needs victory, for those who need direction, for those who need joy, may they expect to find it, and God, may their conduct be changed. God, for each and every one of us this Christmas season, if we see the opportunities in front of us, we know that it will require sincere investigation. God, we will seek you with all of our heart. We'll travel the distance from our feet to our knees simply to seek you, make ourselves available to you. God, we will take great risk, a risk to stand up and say, I believe, a risk to restore a relationship. God, we'll take that risk. God, we will worship this Christmas season. We will bow our knees. God, may we be overjoyed before Sunday because we're expecting you to act on our behalf. And God, this Christmas season, we'll also have opportunity to share your love with somebody else. May we be faithful. God, continue to speak to us as we think about offering our very best to you this day, this week, and every day you give us breath. In Jesus' name I pray. Will you stand this morning? We simply sing together, Sacrifice of Love.
Hey, go ahead and have a seat. Uh, the band's going to keep playing, and we're going to give you a chance in just a minute to come forward and, and give your gift. And uh, I told, uh, I, I want to ask you to, to please forgive my corniness. Uh, it's time to give the, the special Christmas offering, the one from the yellow envelope. And we're going to ask you to come forward and, and put it in, in this. See the need, hear the call, meet the need, anyone can. Can. As a very simple reminder, that out of a simple attitude of obedience and a willingness to do it, God can take out of this can 100 pennies out of every dollar, take it, bless it, multiply it, and do more than we could even ask for the children of this community. And so here's what we're going to ask you to do as the band continues to play. I want to pray, pray a prayer of blessing over you and over this offering. Uh, whether you came today ready to give or not, that doesn't matter. But if you came today to give, we're going to invite you to come forward. I, I can count uh, on one hand two times that we've ever taken an offering and asked people to come forward and present it. This is the second one. The only other one was when we took an offering for the purchase of this facility over at Bauer Elementary School. We're, we're taking two offerings today. So if you came today ready to give your regular tithes and offerings and you've got it in one of these envelopes or you're just going to give it different, don't give that, don't put that in this can, please. Just use this as an opportunity uh, to give this offering. Uh, as I get ready to pray a prayer blessing, I want to tell you a story. And I was with a family this week who was going through something and in the midst of talking with them about what they're going through, they, they looked at me and and one of them looked at me and said, this Sunday's the Sunday we get to give our offering, right? And even in the midst of what they were walking through, I was just, my heart was so touched that they were, they were thinking beyond just what they were immediately going through in the ministry of the local church. Uh, this, uh, this envelope, you can see, uh, it's got a, got a stamp on it. This envelope came uh, in the mail. If you didn't come ready today to give, the, take one of those yellow envelopes. It's got the church address on it. Put a stamp on it. Mail it in. And so I just want to take this as a, as a faithful gift. I don't know who, who gave this and just put it in the put it in the offering and then this one this one came in this morning this this person doesn't know that I saw them um, most of the time when I'm getting ready for Sunday mornings I'll go to my office and I'll I'll uh, just pray and I, I kind of pace while I pray and I'll take time and as I pray for our community as I pray for Miamisburg I look out my office window and I look out into Library Park and so I can kind of see Fifth Street and I see somebody pull down Fifth Street and I notice that all of a sudden they're pulling into our parking lot but they're coming in the wrong way they're coming in the out and I'm like, oh, great. Is there construction going on here? What's the deal? Is there parking problems? I don't know what's going on. So I kind of watch a little bit longer. And this person backs up and pulls right in front of the office. And they get out, and I see a yellow envelope in their hand. And I can tell that they're, they're dressed for work. I happen to know what they do for a living, and they're, and they're dressed for work. But they wanted to come this morning and give their gift, even though they couldn't be present. And so we put this gift in this can as well, thankful. And we're thankful for every gift. If you are still considering giving, please feel free to mail these in, bring these through the rest of the year. But if you came today ready to give, I, I just want to say a prayer. I don't want anybody to feel bad. Nobody's watching if you're not giving. This is just sometimes you need to, an outward expression of, a, of an inward commitment. And so we're just going to invite you to come if you came ready to give. If you'd like for us to pray with you, the pastoral staff will be down front. We'd love to pray with you. If there's anything we can help you with on your journey today. So would you pray with me as we take this, this offering? Father God, thank you. Thank you that this Christmas season we find your sacrificial love, your revelation, the incarnation, and the salvation of Jesus. And God, now in these moments, in a very small way, we, we come and we bring to you our very best. God, I, I want to ask you right now that you would bless the giver. Father, that they will continue to see you as the giver of every good and perfect gift and that, God, you continue to meet every single need that they have. God, that's your promise. So may they know your blessing and your favor. And God, I'm asking you that you would bless this offering. We take it and we give it right back to you. God, I'm asking that you would do with this offering what Jesus did with loaves and fishes. In some way, in a way that only you can. We get to see thousands of hungry children fed. So God, take this offering and bless it. And Father, in these moments in front of you, we've said and we just make ourselves 100% accountable. 
to be faithful with 100 pennies out of every dollar to go to take care of children and families in our community. Father, we love you. We thank you for the privilege of giving the small sacrifice. In the precious name of Jesus, I pray. Amen. As you're ready, the band's just going to continue to play. You come and you give uh, the gift that you brought today, if you would, please. Uh, Christmas Eve, Saturday night, 4 o'clock, 10 o'clock. Bring a friend as we celebrate a Star City Christmas. We've been encouraging to find somebody, intercede for somebody, invest in somebody, invite somebody to come with you as we talk about what it means not to just keep uh, Christmas in Bethlehem thousands of years ago, but to bring it to this, the Star City, Miamisburg, and to the region where we live. So come celebrate 4 o'clock, 10 o'clock, and then again next Sunday morning, uh, 10 o'clock, as we get together on, on Christmas Sunday, all right? So let's pray together. Almighty God, thank you again for your kindness, for the love that's available to us in Jesus. God, this week, may we expect to receive everything you promise. And may our conduct reflect our expectations of your love and your mercy. And now, my brothers and sisters, as you go from this place, may you go with the blessing and in the favor of God himself who loved you so much that he gave you his son. May you go understanding he knows the crisis of your soul and may you be radiant with joy because he has heard you and because he is concerned. Go from this place in the peace of favor of God. Until we meet next week on Saturday, or this week on Saturday night and next Sunday morning, may his peace be with you. Peace be with you.